to, wow, let's just run through these real quick here. Let's run through Sam Gill's list of vitagraphs. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that. Everyone will hate me. <laughs> uh, Sam, the Sam Gill list. Let's just, um, just to give some, uh, no, I kid. No, it's hard to, to, cause you hate to uh, not include some people and recognize some people. But, well, uh, and yeah, Tony put together a wonderful list and I thought, well, that's fine. Yeah, boy, those are all great. And then typical of my overactive brain for people who know me that know what I'm talking about. I, you know, I couldn't sleep at night. It was kind of like, yeah, but what about Mary Maurice? And gee, what about, oh my gosh, and the kids. And how about, oh yeah, who's, oh, Harry Maury. Gosh, you know, yeah. got to have Harry Maury. So by the time I was done, I think I probably gave uh, Steve and Tony what, like three times as many names as we were originally going to have. So yeah. <laughs> if anyone really hates this part, blame it all on me. Yes, yes. No, no we need to talk about the, the main people. So let's start, let's start with, um, let's start with, of course, Maurice Costello. Ah, yes. Yes. Got to start with Maurice. Big matinee idol. Yeah, mm -hmm. so he was on. Yeah. You know, it's funny in interviews, he later said, oh, back in the Vitagraph days, we all did whatever was needed of us, whether it was working in the carpentry shop or whatever. Well, the truth is, as far as I know, that he never would do that, but everyone else did that was uh, employed there. I've not had a chance to read Terry Chester Shulman's um, biography of the Costellos. Oh, I yeah, I may be all incorrect about these things, so I have to, you know. Oh, but he, uh, he um, I need to credit him. He went by and um, he got those pictures of the Vitagraph destruction. He, those pictures are, should be credited to him. Um, also, he, he also brought Helen and Dolores into the movie business. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Yeah, that's right. And here's the first, some movie, I guess some would regard movie star Florence Turner. Yeah, the Vitagraph girls. Florence. Yeah. If it hadn't been for World War I, she would have had uh, quite a career in England. You know? Yeah. She even had her own studio that was located there, but... Uh, Turner Films, right. Turner Films. But the war really interrupted, you know, really interrupted their production. It, the war had, uh, of course, a terribly negative effect on the uh, world wide cinema so yeah because uh, i mean turner films was she and lawrence trimble it, yes because they went to england and they, i think it was they were working at the hepworth studio they set up and they took gene with them actually gene made some films there in england with them uh was, if you see the logo for turner films it's gene mm -hmm. and those who uh, uh, love strongheart Trimble later became sort of Stronghearts uh, Crusader and that's uh, right handler. I think you could say his second dog star. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep moving through these photos, guys. Sure. sure. Helen Gardner. Very great in dramatic roles. Yeah. Although this isn't a vitagraph, most will know her from Oh Cleopatra. Cleopatra. Which um that was later on, but yeah, she was there. And we've got Clara Kimball Young, who we Young. saw in the Vitagraph Romance. Yeah. And here is a poster of her and Maurice Costello and Dolores and Helen Costello. Oh. And fellow mm -hmm. boys. Wonderful. Was, and then here's her father that we did see in the Vitagraph Romance. Edward Kimball. Edward Kimball. Got Charles Kent. Yeah, other than Mary Maurice, I think uh, he was the oldest member of the. Mm -hmm. Vitagraph really gave a lot of opportunity to some of the great actors, basically who had careers in the in the eighteen hundreds more than the uh, early nineteen hundreds. But it gave them a great chance, and they're wonderful actors. Yeah, there was a, another guy, George Ober who was an older guy. Um, he's in some of like the 1911 things and stuff. 
wonderful performers. You guys know th this. I know her best, Julia. Yeah, Julia, Julia Swain Gordon. Oh, oh yes. She played more character roles uh, and into the this, uh, 20s. What I remember from Lady Godiva, which is on YouTube. <laughs> you yeah, can you, you would choose that one. Do what? I said you would choose that yes, one. Yes, of course. <laughs> Was that Kate Price holding That's the horse? That's Kate Price, yeah. <laughs> holding yeah. the horse, yeah. yeah. That this is on YouTube. You can watch you can watch this on YouTube. You know that everybody was rushing to the theater thinking they would see her. But look, she's got baggy stockings around her ankle. Oh yeah, yeah. You can see the wrinkles of the body. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really flesh there. I love it. Yes, yeah, so they have Kate Price completely covered up. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. It is it is true, though, that, you know, uh, almost anyone there could be asked to play any kind of role. So you do see even fairly major players uh, uh, popping up all different in different roles. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Very Le true. Leo Delaney. Oh, yes. Yeah, he died quite young, 1920. There seems to be kind of a Vitagraph curse or something for a lot of people who died rather young. I just saw him in a film with Gene and Florence Turner. Of course, I can't remember the title, but he wants to marry Florence, but her dog, Gene, doesn't like him. So he kidnaps Gene and, like, tries to starve her and then feed her fancy bones so she'll like him. So then he returns her to Florence, and Florence, and then when he comes over, Gene, uh, Gene's happy to see him, so Florence will marry him. But he actually kidnaps the dog. It's really strange. Yeah, at some point I'd like us to talk a bit about uh, Vitagraph's emphasis on stories. They, they really could put, choose some great stories and, or take one and develop it into a screenplay. So at some point I'd like to, you know, mention, talk about that just a little bit. No, no, we, no, we should uh, no, talk about whenever you want to because really they – I think that they said artistically, you know, Biograph was artistic, but they said Vi uh, Vitagraph was really for the people. I, I don't know where I read that at or had, had that explained. But yeah, story-wise, they were doing, um, you know, very high Francesca de Remini. And, A lot um, of Shakespeare adaptations. Shakespeare and yeah. maybe Mark Twain and um, adaptations. So they were really... Um, uh, uh, Greta DeGroote said looks like US UCLA has Mr. Minturn's Misadventures directed by Rannis oh. Young and Costello she wrote in going oh, back great. going oh, back a few you. pictures thank you Greta here's Paul oh, Panzer Paul Panzer I just love Paul Panzer and for anyone who loves uh talkies we can mention talkies here i think you <laughs> spot paul panzer he must have made a thousand movies i mean yeah begin, yeah he was one of the first salary uh, players there and uh worked throughout oh my gosh for years and years and years in the word to pathé he was all over oh gosh all over the place and uh so he's one of my favorite when i ever spot him in a film greta also mentions the stumbling block that I, I has it. It's oh. Gene, Leo Delaney, and Florence Turner. That's the one I couldn't remember the title where Leo kidnaps Gene. Yeah. Stumbling well, block. That's well, it. Well, Thank you, Greta, for the um what was that it? information. The stumbling block. The stumbling block, nineteen eleven. But it, it's so bizarre that he decides to kidnap the dog. It's, it's a little disturbing. <laughs> okay, there's James Morrison again that we saw in a Vitagraph romance oh. and um there always had to be the handsome leading man. Yes. Uh, Edith Story. Ah, yes. Quite an incredible woman and uh, great on horses as well. She worked for the Malleus American Company as well as Vitagraph and many other companies. Oh, yeah. She worked with Francis Ford, didn't she, at Malleus? Uh, yes, she did. And so she was uh, quite, you know, one of the quite a few of the women at that time were uh, hero the heroines in films. They, they weren't the ladies in distress so much as 
you know, they would they would save the guy. <laughs> so uh, she was one of those who could easily save her leading man when he got into trouble. He was also good in character comedy too. But yes, Adele de Garde. Adele was, de Garde. She was really hugely popular. When you go back into the the early teens, it's interesting how for a few years some of these child stars were just enormously popular, and she was one of them. That's going to lead us on to other child stars. Ah. There's Helen and Dolores. Here they are. So this is Drew Barrymore's grandmother. Yeah. And did you know they actually made it on the playing card deck? I didn't know that. Oh. Uh, okay. Well, that's the deck where Chaplin's the Joker. Jack, Chaplin's the Joker, yeah. Yeah. The deck's yeah, but... always missing the Chaplin, whenever you find a deck. <laughs> that's always missing. And there's another one of Helen. That's nice. Nice. Oh, and this is always a sad story for Bobby. Oh, Bobby Connolly. Yeah. Bobby Connolly died very like 13 or something, 12 or 13, but he was yeah, 13 years old. And uh, yeah, appeared in, a, yeah, 1922. He appeared a lot with the Drews. You know, he's in things like a case of eugenics and things like that with the Mr. and Mrs. Sidney Drew sometimes too. Yeah. See, and a Sonny Jim, that also was an extremely popular series. So yeah. uh, sometimes it wasn't like our gang. Uh, there were other attempts at, at such things, but he was very popular as a child actor. Great poster. This is a great poster. It's not a vitagraph, but it's a great. Well, I'm glad you put it in. It's beautiful. Yeah. And there's another shot of poor Bobby. Then we got um, Norma Talmadge. Ah. Of course, it's a great shot. And there she is again. And Mabel Norman, who didn't didn't stay that long, but she was in I know. She yeah. was funny some. One turned up recently called uh, Widow Comes to Sprigtown. Yeah. You, where it did was, you say you, you did see It was that shown at. at the Bristol Slapstick last year under a different title, Bunny in Society. And somebody yeah, wrote to me and said, me about that. Norman. And they had it dated as 1913. And they said, Mabel Norman's in it. And I said, well, it has to be like 1911. And it turned out to be the widow comes to Sprigtown. Yeah. I and I, finally, I did get to see it. And Mabel, uh, Lillian Walker is the main female, but Mabel plays her friend. And she has quite a bit to do in the film. Here's somebody we've not mentioned on our in our run through was Frank Daniels. Oh yes. Oh yes. I have to bring Frank in. I've it's kind I've, of I found a letter um, from Vitagraph on eBay uh, dated 1916 and it said and they were still releasing bunny films and with Sidney Drew and this was a letter that said we're stopping the bunny films and the Drew films because we're going to start these Frank Daniel films. And, and we're going to say they were, I guess, you know, they were reissuing after Bunny's death and showing the Drew and they go, now we're going to send Frank, Frank Daniels is the. No. I mean, I yeah, think, I think he wasn't there he very was, long, though, I don't think. He was meant to be Bunny's replacement. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Here he is. And a little bit of a resemblance. He, he kind of had the Popeyes, you know, and he, big expressions. Yeah. Colonel Nutt was. He appeared in many of his films. And here's uh, Harry Davenport. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Very important. The Sidney Drew's brother-in-law. And also he played... I was going to... I saw that, but I, I didn't trace it. I was going to ask you if that was correct. Well, they were married. There were three Rankin sisters. Gladys, Phyllis... And Doris. They were the daughters of McKee Rankin, the actor. And... One was married to Sidney Drew, his first wife. One was married to Harry Davenport. The other was married to Lionel Barrymore. Can't imagine a family reunion. So Sidney Drew was Lionel's um, uncle and brother-in-law at the same time, which is kind of weird. I want to thank Kay Shackleton at the, the Movie Gal uh, for this yeah. picture. Too. Another Harry Davenport. It's a great yeah. shot. Oh, beautiful very, shot. Very, yeah, very rare. I've never seen that image. This of is, it. yeah, this was, I couldn't believe when I found it. I, I just found it today and I wrote it real quick and I said, hey, can I use that? Uh, go <laughs> to si silenthollywood.com is her site where she's got a lot of these photos. 
that this is well, the only one that I got from her too. I had to get another one. But here's he how, had that. Here's how I remember Harry Davenport is probably later on as the older. Well, he had that starring series, The Jar Family, at Vitagraph. Yeah. Which I think any of those are known to survive, unfortunately. This is a, um, here's another one right here, certainly odd and diverting. <laughs> here he is with Huey Mack and Charles Brown. So. But laughs. Yeah. Uh, this is another one that I got from Kay Shackleton because it's hard to find a, per a picture of this. Jay Dwiggins. Jay Dwiggins. And Bryant Washburn's the guy in the back. Yeah. So I want to thank Kay for this photo also because it is hard to find good high quality photos of and this is later too this isn't yeah even yeah, vitagraph time a little bit. now he he also died uh with quite very shortly after this film was made in 1919 yeah same, same year that sydney drew died because he he appeared at stuff in keystone and you know later too triangle and keystone and stuff but yeah, some of the triangle comedies. And we're features all, with Doug Fairbanks. He was in some of those. We're almost, we're almost through the um, actors, just in case, yeah. just, just in case anybody's everybody. waiting. There's Huey Mack, who, we hey, talk Huey. About, who still owes Steve five bucks. And That's right. Well, you know, he became a favorite of Eric Von Stroheim because Von Stroheim used him in Greed and the Wedding March and, you know, Here's Earl Williams. He was very popular. You see him. Yeah, into the 1920s. Oops, I got back to um, jump to Harry Harry Morey too soon. Whoop. Yeah, Harry Morey was especially good at villains. Yeah. This was the Earl Williams I skipped over. Sorry about that. So. And so then we got Harry Harry T. Morey. And uh, Sam's favorite, Mrs. Mary Maurice. <laughs> Yes. Who was in the film today? Yes, um, Mrs. Lippers. Lip, uh, Lodger. Lodger. Yeah, she had quite yes. a quite a lot to do in that one. Yeah, she, she did. She yeah, has an ex excellent performance in that. So I do recommend that uh, to take some time out and watch that. It's quite a good film. And there's it's going to be available for the next till tomorrow, I think. It's yeah, gonna be available. There's a missing Mr. and Mrs. Sidney Drew that she's in. I'd love to see. It's called. It's called. Is Christmas a bore? <laughs> and I think she plays Sidney's mother, and she's upset because he won't. She he won't wear her Christmas present or something. I'd love to see it, but it's not known to exist. I just want to tell you. I know that people have wrote. I've got forty nine questions over here. <laughs> I'll try to get. Most of them, most of them are we can't hear the sound on the documentary, but I will go and I will try to, <laughs> I'll go and I'll try to go through these questions too. Um, we'll have to we quickly go here. Oh. Antonio Moreno. Antonio Moreno, right. And uh, Corinne Griffin. And uh, well, we didn't mention Leah Baird either. That wasn't on your, she wasn't on your wow. list, man. Yeah. Well, I, I was sleeping then. You were sleep. And one of the rare times you've slept on this project, I'm sure. <laughs> Very true. And of course, Gene, the vitamin uh, Gene. dog. Gene, beautiful shot. And we have to mention, although yes. it's iffy, around the 1902, he was there for a couple of years at Vitagraph at the very, very beginning. Uh -huh. Bronco Billy Anderson. And um, I don't even want to get into this. Have you? Well, uh, all I especially I like to say is it's and David Keene uh, who's written a marvelous book Bronco Billy and the SNA Film Company mm -hmm. has pointed out in his early career he pops up and directs or is involved with most of the major milestone early films of the Edison Company including yeah. the train robbery the Sealing Company the Vitagraph Company and then launches SNA and becomes Bronco Billy. So, yeah. you know, he, he never quite got the attention uh, that I think he deserved, really. And then, you know, he kind of dropped out of films uh, quite early on and uh, didn't seem to miss them particularly. But he did come back in 1958 to get an Academy Award. Right. 
Right. A, he was a theatrical producer. He had that theater in San Francisco, the Gaiety or something, that he was kind of operating at the same time. So Yeah, yeah he, he went back and forth from his uh, work in the theater uh, as a theater, you know, owner and producer. Right. And, uh, and also developer of, of players. You know, he had a wonderful eye of picking people up. As anyone who sees the SNA films know, you know, he really was great at picking talent. And yeah. gave. And even those people whose careers didn't go on are usually really wonderful, like Edna Fisher, who uh, was in some of his early films as his leading lady. And of course, Marguerite Clayton. Yeah. And uh, others. So, but anyway, I digress. I go <laughs> kind of slip, but I'm actually speaking from the theater in Niles, California, where the SNA company was located from 1912 to 1916, making their westerns and Snakeville comedy westerns. Snakeville, yes. <laughs> My favorite. Yes, wonderful. And it's a great place, and everybody should go there if you've not been. When, when you're open again. Yeah, we're, clo we're closed now, I'm sorry, but w that's why we're doing some of these special online programs so that we can, you know, let keep everyone, uh, you know, aware that we're still here and we, as soon as we can get back to normal, we'll love to do that. Okay, let's, um, I think it's um, the feudist time. So we oh, can kind of stay on schedule. So we're going to watch a... Uh, the only film where John Bunny and Sidney Drew appear together. And Ben Modell will never forgive us because we're going to talk a little bit over his uh, piano <laughs> score. <laughs> but I'm going to make this available so that um, you can watch it without us speaking. <laughs> and you can just hear Ben's score. So many of you will. But we're going to talk about the people in it. Let's just... Let's just do that as we watch it. But you might not even be able to hear the music with the way everything's been going anyway. <laughs> um, so let's um, we're uh, going to you start did this. Care, you did take care of your, the distortion. I'm not hearing that now. The distortion is gone, yes. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Oh, goodness, one thing went. So this has, this is a Vitagraph All-Star. Can you hear any of that music at all? No. No, I can't. Okay. This might have something to do with my headphone. Let me take this off. Can you hear it now? No. No. Yes. There, there we did. I did for a minute. Just for a, a minute. How about now? Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? You echo a little, but yeah. that's okay. Yeah. Let's, uh, Steve, you might want to talk a little about Josie Sadler there. Sure, yeah. The the large lady, the larger lady next to Flora Finch is Josie Sadler, and she was a big stage star in the late 1800s. She was discovered by Tony Pastor, the legendary producer, and she sort of specialized in, in comedies where she played immigrant girls. She'd play Cockneys or Swedish girls or German girls. And uh, she spent 1913 and 1914 working at Vitagraph. Uh, and they actually had a, she had her own series of five films called the Josie series. And she played uh, like a kitchen maid who had come over from Germany. And her boyfriend was played by Billy Quirk. And it was sort of, you know, it was always about their misadventures going to Coney Island or going somewhere. And again, unfortunately, none of those exist. Uh, but she's in The Feudist. She's also in a wonderful film that the Museum of Modern Art has a copy uh, called Bunny Backslides, where Bunny and Flora Finch go to a health spa because they, they're she, Bunny and uh, Flora are going to get married, and she wants him to lose weight, and he wants her to gain weight. So they go to this health spa, and of course Bunny keeps gaining weight; he never loses weight, and he meets this flirty fat woman who's played by Josie Sadler, and 
he gets frustrated and decides that he and Josie are going to elope and he's going to forget Flora. And he's happy being fat. So. Uh, one thing, you mentioned the dialect. Uh, a lot of these actors were very adept at dialect on the stage. And uh, quite a few commentators, when Bunny went into film, said, well, I miss all those dialects that he would do so well. So right. uh, and he uh, was able to do a lot of... He did a lot of dialects on stage? Yes, a lot of different dialects. And he also spoke several languages fluently. So this is a little unusual for Sidney Drew to have the... the goatee and the kind of funny hair, the forelock. And, uh, I, I've never seen him wear that particular uh, makeup. It's such an odd uh, look. And of course, it's you know, completely different than the regular Sidney Drew character that would develop, you know. Yeah. Now, the teenage boy with the cap is Paul Kelly. Yes, the same Paul Kelly that uh, went on in the films in the 30s and 40s. Yeah, he's like in Crossfire, a lot of film noir kind of things. And the boy, the smaller one is Kenneth Casey. I had Kenneth Casey photo. We didn't cover him in the stars. He was definitely one of their biggest. Kid wow. stars, yeah. And of course, these are real houses somewhere in Brooklyn. Uh, there's Lillian Walker, known as Dimples. And who's that little girl? I forget her name. She wasn't in much. Um, the, the, the slightly uh, uh, taller girl is Helen Connolly and the Bobby Connolly sister. And the real uh, girl is, her name is apparently Sydney Cummings. But I, yes. don't, I don't know anything about her. <laughs> uh, and there's Wally Van. And of course, he had his own series. He was known as Cutie. <laughs> yeah. Dimples and Cutie. Yeah. And they, they it's said that Wally Van was uh, like working on... Uh, Blackton's yacht. Yeah, he He's, was like his on lead. He was like one of his crew, main crew guys. And he thought he was good movie material and put him in the movies and he became very popular. But he stayed working on Blackton's boats from what I understand. He still helped. He still worked on the boats? Yacht races and things like that. He, he never left him from what I understand. He stayed. Because he, he, in his series, he Worked with an actress, Nita Frazier, who he married, who became his wife. Yeah, we might mention that Blackton was as well known as Commodore J. Stewart Blackton. <laughs> yes. Or his sailing. Yes. Views. Well, I think he won a lot of trophy things, I think. Trophies, yes, he did. This is one of the rarer times that Bunny wears a little more makeup than usual. Yeah, you'll see a quite the white face here. Yeah. Cause it's, it's interesting because usually in the Vitagraph films, you don't see much makeup on the actors. Like, like Sydney and, and Josie look pretty natural. Wally and... Uh... Yeah, I, I think, but I'm convinced that they did that because you really can see more expressions that you don't have quite so much makeup on. Well, and it, they is to... it is filmed outside too, so... Yeah, I was going to say, because they did a lot of exteriors, so they had that natural sunlight. So they didn't have to have it. If they were inside, they would have probably had 
a lot more makeup on too. With the, yeah, they'd get washed out with the steel bike. Oh, we haven't talked about Flora. Flora Finch, yes. That's who I think, who, you know, is wonderful. I think she's always on the money. She's always hilarious. Yes, Flora Finch was British born, very uh, well known with the Ben Greek company in England. Yeah. And came to this country, did very, very well here, but became quite well known really working in the Vitagraph films, although a lot of people assumed that she was Mrs. John Bunny in real life. <laughs> <laughs> she was not. <laughs> no, her husband's last name was Marsh, I think. Yes. Because they yeah, had a daughter who, who like died in 1926 or something. I, I love this fight and it I to me it looks like a real fight. And Paul Kelly, as we all know, knew how to fight. <laughs> he definitely has the upper hand as we can see in that. Well, we, we were talking the other day that he actually went to prison is because of the outcome of a... Uh, yes. here's, Bunny, here's Bunny with the white, very white. Now, if you notice, this is an interior shot, so they did put a yeah. lot of makeup. That's true. Well, this might have been a, an open roof, though. This might have really been outside, though. But, um, well, what we'll do is instead, we'll, um, we'll tack the end of this on to... Whenever we post this webinar, we'll tack this whole film on to the end, and I'll uh, put the uh, documentary back at the beginning so people can watch all this without us talking, too. They can watch it now, but then they can watch it at the end. And, and so, also hear the, the wonderful musical score. And they can hear, yeah, the, yeah they can hear Ben's score. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this. We've watched it, but it's interesting to see. It's always um, to see um, Paul Kelly uh, later in life. If you don't, if you recognize Paul Kelly, he is. Um, let me show you a picture of him. That little boy is this guy, Paul Kelly. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's how I see him look later. Not, yeah. Much. Much later. So he was. Paul Kelly really is kind of an astonishing career because he was a child actor and then had a few years there, you know, but he loved Broadway and play, yeah. you know, theater. So he kind of moved back and forth and back and forth from films into theater and back. And then uh, 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 unfortunately got into an altercation with uh, a woman and uh, uh, got into a fight with another man who uh, died and uh, from the fight. And so he originally he had went, went uh, murder charges, but they were lessened to uh, manslaughter. But 1927, he was convicted and sent to prison. And is one of the extremely rare cases where within a year or two coming back, he went back into the theater for a few years and then returned to films and had a, a major career, much yeah. better known well, and on the stage, I think uh, Steve, didn't he also get an award for his performance on, in Command Decision on the stage? Yeah, I think so, yeah. 1948, I think. He had a, yeah, I mean, he ended up with a very good career. There's an, another actor, too, that started at Vitagraph was the character comedian Donald McBride. Because uh, he often plays Sidney Drew's brother-in-law. He turns up as Mrs. Drew's obnoxious brother. And then later in the 1930s and 40s, he would play, you know, kind of excitable cops. He's in room service with the Marx Brothers. And, uh, you know, someone else, too. Uh, Etienne Girardot was very popular at Vitagraph. And I just watched the Kennel murder case with uh, William Powell and Mary Astor, and he plays the medical examiner. Very, very funny role. Yeah, he and has that big role in the 20, 20th century. He's the religious fanatic that puts the stickers all over everything, the little guy. Yeah, and so he, he's another one to, I, I love I, having my Etienne Giro dose sightings. <laughs> long career. Very long. Yeah. All right, we are. Let's talk about 
uh, real quick. Let's talk about the reason really the three of us know each other. And that is what Sam just put behind him, John Bunny. Yes. And uh, Monday is John Bunny's birthday. And, um, for, and Sam and I have quite, um, I don't know, our story's really similar, how we got, how we know John Bunny and how we got to know John Bunny because it's from the same books. And we were quite shocked whenever we first talked that um, we've had this fascination. And so I've looked for Sam like 10 years ago. It was always Sam Gill. I would always say Sam Gill, Sam Gill. And um, people would get Sam Gill whenever I'd ask about you, where's Sam, how can I get a hold of Sam Gill? And they'd say, hey, get me mixed up with David Gill. Can, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, um, but anyway, so John Bunny, anyway, whenever I finally um, was able to find you because I've been wanting to do a documentary. I've been fascinated with this guy because whenever I read um, it was Joe Franklin's book, The Start, that I read about John Bunny, you know, he dedicated a chapter to Bunny. So I thought, oh, this guy's important. So whenever I was young and I was reading these books, I thought he was just as important as everybody else because Franklin gave a whole chapter to him. Same with Chaplin and same with every, every, all the other comedians. And then, of course, um, when Daniel Blum's pictorial history has yeah. Bunny, but then he disappears, like his picture, you know, because it's um, um, by year. So, like 1915, his picture stops. So it's like, what happened to this? What happened to this guy? So finally, and that's when I went to run into Steve on Facebook. Gosh, it's been like 11 years ago, I, th <laughs> I think. And um, so Steve, and then I finally get a hold of Sam, and you guys uh, really helped me get this together and get the films um, to be able to do the documentary. Sam, what, do you want to say anything about about Bunny? And because you got to meet us, you interviewed his son and everything. And yes, uh, very similar to your story, Tony. Uh, just a few, you know, and uh, a bit earlier time period since I'm older than you are. Uh, so, uh, you know, I began to see pictures of him every once in a while, maybe on television, there would be some program about the earliest days of film, and it'd be like, the uh, clip would be so brief, it'd be like, whoa, but, you know, it came and went. Uh, and I thought, well, he, and then the more I read, the more I thought, well, he apparently was like a major, major figure in early film, so what happened? <laughs> and I became intrigued to know uh, more about him and his career uh, and of course, what happened to him? And I couldn't seem to find very much there. I looked through the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature in those old days, which um, served as an index to magazine articles going back way, way back. And so I found a few in our local library that were actually written at the time uh, of his life, uh, interviews with him, uh, several wonderful ones, actually. And that only piqued my interest more. And so at some point I thought, well, I just have to learn more about it. Uh, and then I think I had mentioned to you one kind of unusual thing that, uh, be, you know, the problem was there would be so little about him. I thought, well, am I, am I misunderstanding this? Was he not as important as I thought he was? But when uh, I was in high school, a friend of mine at college invited me to come see the college, the University of Kansas in Lawrence. And uh, he introduced me to his landlady, Catherine Lyon Mix, who was a very well-known literary historian. And we were sitting there drinking, uh, I won't say how much of what, but that, and uh, eating snacks. And my friend, uh, John Robert, turned to her and said, oh, I should mention to you, that Sam is very interested in silent screen comedy. And she stopped and actually moved up to the edge of her chair and said, I want you to know that the finest comedian we have ever had in this country was John Bunny. <laughs> and I, I just nearly collapsed right there on the spot. Now I'm talking about like mid sixties that that happened. And I thought, oh, there's one person in the world that I can, you know, find that agrees with me. <laughs> so there well, were the 
Two I, it's it's depressing to you know when whenever I was young and I would read film go in and read film books I'd go to the library and it's oh it's a here's a book about silent comedy and there'd be like one line about John Bunny so is <laughs> yeah, that and there are usually the same picture too you know the same picture. the same picture and the same kind of caption but no new information yeah. and, then the, cool. and then the and then. Yeah, go ahead. The, on, the only film that you could see was a cure for pokeritis. It was like a, that was the only film that. Uh, yeah, that the only one available for years. Now, yeah. Regardless, I, you know, yeah. pre nineteen fifteen, you know, is not exactly the most popular. You know, people don't exactly. I can understand those films are not as popular as the twenties. Comedy is a little bit different, but there, well, without a I, doubt, Bunny was just the super popular with children and. Um, everything. I mean, he was just, um, you know, you you can't doubt that. I mean, he was the first, and here he is. He had the first doll, <laughs> the first doll made out of him. And there's another version of the. Oh, God. Uh, you know, here's some ads. He was, I mean, he was he was pitching stuff. He's he's uh, was doing selling um. um you know, Backup. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, uh -huh. and tobacco and everything so he was um let me see if i can find another um another there were the little statues too you could get the, the little figures yeah, the little statues um yeah i'd I mean, love to get one of those what'd you say i'd love to get one of those you yeah. know one of the statues and things. yeah that would be um let me try here's just a small picture of the stat one of the statues that was a bunny statue. I mean, there was a lot of different, a lot of different ones. But uh, here's the one that you probably know um, that you see in the ads the most is um, is this? Or are you seeing that? You're getting that right? Ah, yes. Yes. So drive dull care away. <laughs> you should have John Bunny in your home. So. Um, so, and these things go for a lot of money. Yeah, oh, I bet. Yeah. yeah. It's like yeah. the Latino Lane dolls, you know. Oh, it, 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 there are many, many rare dolls. I, we here in the museum had a chance to visit with one of the great doll collectors and uh, who had some baby Peggy dolls, you know. Ah. And baby Peggy, Diana Sarah Carey, used to come visit our museum quite often. And... Uh, we would get to see some of those dolls, but uh, I asked her, I said, well, the rarest one that I've never seen is Alkali Ike. That was ah. Augustus Carney in 1913. I saw a photo of one. I, I've seen a picture, but, and she said, I've, in all my years of collecting, I've never found one. Ah. Uh, and she said, there was also a Bronco Billy doll, which survives, and there are those. But she says, I've never seen the Alkali Ike doll. So that's even rarer than John Bunny, I guess. Oh, I, I, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure they, um, so, uh, and anyway, the, the Bunny documentary, um, it's, it's available on the museum website. So um, check it out. And it gives a lot of, um, it's the story of film. And he was really a stage actor that understood that film acting was different than stage acting. And um, he was a little, he was arrogant. And, um, but he, he just didn't have a chance to do much because he died. He died in 1915. So his career just did not last, um, last much at all. So we can come back to Bunny. We are at an hour and a half into this. So let's go on post 1915 here. We'll, Vitagraph 1915 at the end where, and somebody had a question. Uh, yeah, this is, goes into exactly what we're going into because Rob Farr ah. uh, uh, commented about what we're getting ready to talk about was Larry Seaman slapstick. Yes. Due well, to the dominance of Keystone or what and what, yeah. uh, what happened afterwards. So, um, well, it's interesting. We were talking the other day that before, up to 1915, 1916, Vitagraph was like the bastion of sophisticated comedy, situational comedy with Bunny and Finch and the Drews and Wally Van. 
But after 1916, and Larry Seaman comes to the studio, and probably no doubt due to the popularity of Max Sennett and the Keystone films, then the, the Vitagraph comedies are completely different. They become, you know, a slapstick, you know, out and out Larry Seaman style slapstick. And I find it curious that Blackton leaves Vitagraph like 1916 or 17 and starts his own deal. So he must have been. I don't, I don't know what exactly his thoughts were to go. Maybe he was tired of, the, uh, of a lot of a lot of things that were going on there too. But then Pop Pop Rock died in 1916, and it was just Smith, and he took off. So let's take. Speaking of slapstick, here is courtesy of Dave Glass. We're going to see a clip from Do Drop In. That's that's pretty. Uh, that's pretty hilarious here. Uh, there's no music on this, but we couldn't hear it anyway. But um, but you can see where the slapstick is going here. I, I don't even remember what year this is. Well, and another interesting aspect of this is that Lawrence Seaman, Larry Seaman, was also a very well-known cartoonist. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. In fact, better known as a cartoonist than anything. And so it's interesting that Blackton and uh, uh, Smith, I think, would be, you know, uh, thinking that he might be perfect for films as a director and writer originally. Yeah, I think they hired him from some scripts he had submitted, I think. Yes, Vitagraph was open to uh, scripts submitted by almost anyone who wanted to. And if they liked the idea of it, they'd pay you for it. But they often didn't make it other than just the story idea that was submitted. Watch his foot shake here. This is hilarious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's Bill Haber. That Bill, Bill Haber, yeah. From behind. And he was actually Seaman's stunt double for a number of years. Many considered him the greatest uh, stuntman of his time. Yeah. First to Keystone and then for Larry Seaman. So anyway, you get the idea where the film is going here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when then, you think about it, there, you really couldn't be as far different from John Bunny when you think of it. So, yeah. It, it was obvious, uh, a very, very deliberate choice of Vitagraph to go this entirely different direction in their comedies. Yeah, it's a total sea change, you know. And here comes his officers coming up here. <laughs> anyway, there we well, go. Well, and then, of course, you know, they had the Big V Riot Squad who was with him in a lot of the films, and it was Earl Montgomery and... Uh, Joe Rock and uh, people like that, you know, and of course, most of them went on. Pete Gordon and people like that, you know, went on and had their own careers. Yeah, here's some big V here. Yeah, yeah. Here's, here's Rock, Montgomery and Rock with their own series. Yeah. Yeah, Albert E. Smith Presents. Yes, uh, that was, uh, uh, Steve just said, that was actually kind of a spinoff from their, they were so successful, but unknown by name in the Seaman comedies, but they were so good that they had their own series. And, and again, it was a thing, a situation that Rock said that they put some scripts together and, uh, you know, gave them to Smith and he liked them. So he started starring them. The Sawmill is probably, in my estimation, the most spectacular single two real comedy I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. Guys, well, the first Larry Seaman film I ever saw was The Sawmill, I think from Blackhawk Films. I first saw yeah, they sold a lot of those. They sold a lot of those, the sawmill. I remember seeing those in all the Blackhawk, <laughs> all the Blackhawk yeah. catalogs. Yes. Um, so they, they got more slapstick. So uh, I'm trying to see. Where's my well, they had, they ended up with three major series. They had Larry Seaman, they had Montgomery and Rock, and then they had Jimmy Aubrey as well. Vitagraphs. So that was sort of their their headliners as far as slapstick. Uh, something that's very little known is 
Jordan Young and I had a chance to meet with Jimmy Aubrey when he was <laughs> living out of the Motion Picture Country Home. And uh, he was willing to talk to us. It was quite fascinating because he had very, very uh, provocative thoughts about famous people he had worked with and uh, or he uh, told us work for him, I should That's say. That's right. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, when the name uh, Larry Seaman came up, he said, well, you know, I was uh, at Mittenthal Brothers Studio in Yonkers making uh, starlight comedies of Heine and Louie in 1915 when Lawrence Seaman, Larry Seaman, was brought over by the Mittenthal brothers to be our director. And he said he didn't know anything about film. And he said the problem was he was making the film. Um, they gave him the footage to make it, but he cut it in his head. He, he was so good at doing that, but he shot no extra footage, which meant they had to do it exactly the way that he made it. And, it's, and so, it's kind of interesting. He said that sometimes they would run a little short, a little under a thousand feet, and uh, or you know, considerably less than that. And so they'd have to try and figure out how to pat them out a little bit. But now we're talking 1915 before uh, Seaman even went to Vitagraph. Yeah, he he worked at the supposedly worked for Mitten Falls. And that was up in Yonkers, the Starlights. And he worked for Novelty, which was one of the mutual companies. So there were some little companies that he wrote and directed a little bit for before he ended up at Vitagraph. So yeah. it was sort of happening, you know, he was doing things, you know. But once he got into Vitagraph, then, you know, it was more like the big time for him. <laughs> okay, let's let's go ahead and start wrapping up with the um so we're going to go ahead and wrap up and then um if anybody wants to stick around and we'll get to some of these q a's questions questions here uh but let's talk about real quick about what happens at vitagraph and uh here's a here's a aerial view of vitagraph i'll try to get pulled up here this is circa this is around 1921 here so you can see how much there's there's the glass there's the studios and there's the wow. that's 1921 and then um, of course Vitagraph sells to Warner Brothers in 1925 and right. um, Pop Rock's son and Blackton and Smith split split the money. Sadly, Blackton spins through every bit of it. I think Smith, the businessman, always stayed well off, <laughs> uh, stayed pretty well off. I don't, I don't know much about what happened to Rock's um, son. And then here's Vitaphone a few years later. Right. This is early 30s. Difficult, you know, making the Vitaphone films because you've got the L tracks right here, you know, right? Yeah, by, you know. you've got this right here. So these right studios, by the stack. yeah, these studios are pretty much no good now. So yeah, I think the, yeah. these were the glass. So these they couldn't record anything in these. Uh, right. Anyone, anyone who's come to visit us in Niles here, where the SNA company was, they had a beautiful studio just up the street, about a half a block from where I'm talking, and uh, it was a beautiful studio. But when sound came in. Uh, it wouldn't work because it did, you know, there are train tracks on both sides of it and it would just be impossible. There was no way that you could make it soundproof enough that it would work. And also how would you go outside if you had trains running all the time and the noise from that. So a lot of these early studios just were boarded up or like the old Keystone studio became a storage, you know, public storage uh, facility. and. So uh, uh, those that have survived, you know, were kind of transformed into other things. Right. Okay, I'm going to do some, um, answer some of these questions here. I'll go ahead and answer this, this one because it's a John Bunny question. <laughs> John Bunny's hands always look huge. Did he have elephantitis? 
<laughs> my my belief would be no. Be, I think that he had diabetes severely. I think he had so much water retention. He really, I, I think that was, you know, he, um, you know, I think he was just a big guy in the first place. I mean, he got up to a heavy, got up to a lot, uh, uh, more than 300 pounds, and he was not that tall of guy. And he had, you know, he died of kidney disease too. So he's probably retaining a lot of fluids and things, you know, because yeah. issues. I've got, um, well, if you watch the documentary, you'll see uh, photos of him at the end of his life. And he does not, um, he's very, okay, here, I'll, I'll show this one. Um, how, old was he, how old was he, Tony? 55, something like no, that? No, I think he was just 52, I believe. Was he 52? Uh, okay. But it was early 50s, right? Yeah. Here's a picture here of him. And you can see that. He just, this is the year he died, so that's a big difference. What he looks like. I remember I, this was one of the articles I found uh, when I was a kid, and uh, even at the time when I, I looked at that, and it was in an interview with him, and it doesn't mention his health problem. It just says, and here's you know uh, pictures of John Bunny, and even then as a kid, I thought you know he doesn't look healthy. And yeah. So he, of course, my, my father was a doctor, and maybe I was a little more attuned to those things. <laughs> but that was another thing, is I wanted to know, well, why, did he have health issues? And when I met the son, uh, he, he enlightened me about a lot of that and said that uh, his father actually uh, was in terrible health, particularly near the end. And when he came back from his bunny and funny land, which uh, Tony might want to comment on a little bit, uh, which was a failure, uh, he became very sick. And the son said they brought a lot of experts from all over the world, thought he was going to do better, and then he took a turn for the worse very fast and died. But he said, you know, not once ever did I hear my father complain. Yeah, he, said, he the, the show, he quit. Really, he, did, he stopped making movies for Vitagraph at the end of 1914. The other, they were just released in the next year, but he went on the road with this bunny and funny land. This is a photo from it. Um, I'm skimming through these pictures because they're not in order. I'm trying to find other bunny. Um, uh, there's bunny. Oh, sorry. These, here's another photo from yeah, bunny and funny yeah. land. It was a huge show. Sorry. These are not in order. I, I don't have my bunny, bunny photos in order, but um, so thank you, Michael Oss for that question. Here is, um, this is, I, and Paul, I appreciate you promoting this, um, but I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Any, Echev, Echeverry? Paul? Echeverry? Oh, hi, Paul. Oh, Paul, yeah. yeah Paul, I I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, he, he's a, a wonderful uh, supporter of our museum. Oh, Thanks, he is. Paul. Oh, he is. He's great. He's wrote yeah. about uh, Bunny on his blog and stuff like that. So this is a question for Sam. Um, was there any link between those who made the bunny finches for Vitagraph and the crew that produced the Eddie Lyons and Lee Morin comedies for Nestor and Universal? Well, it sure is interesting that Lyons Moran and, well, Al Christie, of course, came from the stage as well. He was Canadian, not British. But yeah. He had a bit of a uh, similar attitude towards situational comedy and the vow. Uh, and so Christie, uh, very early on, wanted to make not just westerns and comedies and serials and stuff at that time but uh situational comedies and two of his best players were eddie lyons and lee moran and mike oz in fact has a, a wonderful dvd of some of the rarest films and when you get those they almost look like vitagraph films it's interesting how uh, they emphasize the story much more than most other slapstick comedies and uh, they work as a team uh, very, very well. We might want to give a little credit to uh, not just the Drews, Mr. and Mrs., but uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Carter de Haven. Uh, oh, yeah. Just a little bit after Vitagraph uh, and Bunny Films also continued that tradition on for a while. So the de Havens deserve some credit. 
and uh, Charlie Chase was behind quite a few of those. In fact, Bob McGowan of our gang and Charlie Chase were both behind a lot of the Mr. and Mrs. Carter de Haven films. Yeah, uh, Mal St. Clair directed some of those too. An amazing group of, of comic talents behind those. Very uh, sophisticated people. Very wonderful. But uh, that's interesting you mentioned Lions Moran because very, very rarely are, are they mentioned in the same breath as John Bunny. But I, I think you've made a very, very good connection there. I got a question from a guy that I like on Facebook, Bob Greenberg. Ah, who does um, he's an old friend of mine. Is he? Does a great yeah, uh, we're old pals. Yeah, great Oliver <laughs> Hardy, and I see him do um, a Ralph Cramden on there too. He'll do, a, but uh, Lou Costello too. Lou Costello, yeah. Was yeah. Mrs. Mary Maurice the grandma in the Yard Gang talkies? No, no. Mary no. Maurice died. He, he's thinking of Margaret Mann. Yeah. Mary Maurice died in like 1920 or something, didn't she? Yeah, and Fly My Kite, and there's another one that's grandma is Mary Maurice, or is uh, Margaret Mann, who's the mother in Four Sons, in John Ford's Four Sons, 1928. Rena and David wrote in 45 minutes ago <laughs> and said uh -oh. Raffles, Raffles was in 1905, not 1902. Ah. I didn't want to correct you on screen. Please correct <laughs> Correct me. Goodness, goodness. Uh, Greta writes again, has anyone seen the lovesick matings of Cuddleton? Yes, I saw it at Library of Congress. They have a copy of it. Oh, a library. Okay, that's, it is on the list of whenever I yep. got their list of bunny films, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that there. It's really cute. It's a cute film. Does it even have much of bunny in it? I don't think it has. Not a lot. A little bit. It's got Norma. She said Norma Talmadge, the story, Earl Williams, Lillian Walker. Yeah, I think Earl Williams is the main character. He's the new doctor that comes to the small town. And then all the young, and he's, you know, he's young and handsome. So all the, all the young women pretend to be ill so that he'll come and, you know, attend to them kind of thing. So. I'm asking the oldest questions last, so I'm not being fair. Uh, Rich Markow writes, were any films produced at the Brooklyn studios during the early 20s, the last days of the company, and why did Vitagraph peter out mm -hmm. anyway? Yes, they did produce at Brooklyn in the 20s. Captain Blood, or was that, no, was that, was that in California, Captain Blood? That was in that California. Was Cal yeah, I think that, that was, was California. Because they had the studio in California as well, which is yeah. where Louis Seaman went out. You know, eventually he left New York and um, Montgomery and Rock and Aubrey, they were all out in California working for Vitagraph. Oh, By before the, I forget, we didn't even mention Gene Page at all, Mrs. Albert. Oh, Mrs. Smith. Mrs. 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 Albert. Albert Smith. Yes, we didn't even mention her at all. She was a huge, as there in the 20s especially. Well, Starring uh, in their features, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. And I, I really like to express my thanks to two very special people, Gene Page, uh, whose real name was Lucille O'Hare, and she uh, uh, usually used Lucille Smith at, for, uh, in correspondence. But uh, through Phil Corey, who knew her well and was the collaborator with uh, uh, Albert E. Smith for his Two Reels and a Crank, which we might want to mention, which was published in 1952 and was Smith's account of Vitagraph. Uh, she was terrifically helpful with me when I was looking for John Bunny material. And she actually went to the trouble of taking her, her husband's original manuscript and excerpting everything she could find on John Bunny that wasn't even in the book and getting that to me. And then uh, she was also, uh, and the, the other person is Marion Blackton Trimble, who was uh, Jay Stewart Blackton's daughter and uh, Mrs. Larry Trimble later. And I wanted to mention them. And also, uh, Tony Slides uh, was kind of the first historian to uh, do a book, full-scale book on Vitagraph, which was called The Big V. Big V. A, a wonderful, I still remember when that came out. And uh, he dedicated the book to uh, what he said, the co-founders uh, co of my book which I thought was cute. And that's Marion Blackton Trimble and Lucille Smith. So I just kind of wanted to, you know, be able to thank them because a lot of what I learned 
was from those two and from uh, John Bunny Jr. So I just didn't want to not say my thanks to them. Well, you know, I wanted to mention too, Sam, you did the first Bunny filmography. Oh, God. That was in the Silent Picture magazine. Yes, before archives.org. Yeah, what was that, uh, 1970? What year was that? It came out, I wrote, I did it in, the research I did in 67 and 8, and uh, wrote it all up, and then Tony Slide published it in the silent picture in 1972. Right. In the summer, and... uh, uh, that was difficult because uh, the Vitagraph life portrayals were not complete anywhere. Uh, with, yeah. And so uh, that was the best source that I could find for cast lists. Definitely. And they, and they also didn't mention directors in the early years. But uh, I did discover the New York Dramatic Mirror. And for the period late 1910 and 1911 and early 12. I found the New York Dramatic Mirror to actually be the most helpful source of anything. So, uh, yeah. and I can't tell you how many libraries I had to go to to find these things. <laughs> and in those days, you didn't know where they were. So you had to call everybody and say, do you have any of this stuff? So, you know, uh, David Pierce, I had a chance to talk to about archives.org. And I said, you know, now the problem is that there's access to so much material. It's, almost, it's like impossible to figure how you find it all and then distill it all into, you know, your book. So yeah, uh, yeah. I blame him. I blame him, David. <laughs> <Pierce. All right. laughs> Tony, we can't hear you. Can't hear you, Tony. No, no sound, Tony. I muted myself. Andy Arish. There we go. Andy Arish. You mentioned Andy Eris. Is it Eris? Yes, Andy's Andy got Arish. a book coming out on Vita. Yes, and he is watching, and he wrote with a lot of information. Thank you, Andy. And contact me, too. Send me your um, email. He said that Sam Speeden is the man that accompanies Kimball and Clara Kimball Young, James Morrison, and Florence Turner at the end of Vitagraph Romance. Ah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Al, he said Albert Smith wrote the Mill Girl and supervised the shooting, which makes sense because Smith was still doing the directing thing at that time. He said Florence Turner star, so it needs online. It is wrong information, uh, believe it yeah. or not. Yeah. Uh, he said the BFI print of it is very good. William Rainus was, are we pronouncing it Rainus? Rainus was hired after Vitagraph let go of Billy Anderson. Huh. He was lured away by Imp to direct the first three Imp films. And he starred in the first one before he was let go. He came back to Vitagraph, but died a year or two later. And we know Vitagraph touted Jay Dwiggins as Bunny's replacement. Oh, yeah, he starred in that film Bunny's Little Brother. Bunny's Little Brother, yeah. Where they had him with Bunny, and then, and then he and Finch worked together, and Finch didn't work with Bunny again. She worked with Dwiggins. It was like he was a substitute. Like they didn't want to work together anymore or something. Um, he said Harry Davenport played Sidney Drew's boss in The Scapegoat. Yes. Very funny film, too. Uh, he liked the bunny doc. Uh, he said Constance Talmadge was the girl in The Man from Egypt, if he recalls correctly, and his book is out June 9th. So there's your plug. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you for the information. If anybody... Uh, the, I want to see the um, Bunny and Funnyland cartoon that come out after Bunny died, which I guess I've not heard anything. I can't even find reviews for it, but it's a cartoon. Mm. That he does not appear in. I've asked um, animation historians about it. No one seems to know. Um, there was a lot of confusion, too. People, a lot of the public thought that was a, a film with him in it. But it was an animated. Yeah. Film. Perry Palmer was it? I think maybe was the. Yeah, animated. he was. The, and there's not much. The cartoonist. There's not much information. Not a whole lot, about um, about that. So you guys want to wrap up on um, anything else, and then we'll stay um, a little bit. Um, if anybody's got any other questions, um, Albert E. Smith did get an Oscar. In the 50s, he was mm-hmm. 
Um, uh, no, in the late 40s. Oh, in the late 40s, okay. You can correct, Sam, please. You can correct uh, all you want to. With the Academy, I know all about that. And Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. You should know. Yes, please. Um, yeah. William C. Lake, uh, Thomas R. Mott, uh, and um, Albert E. Smith. C. Lake says in his acceptance speech, oh, thank you. And then Smith knocks him out. Uh, and Gene Herschel brings Albert E. Smith on, who talks for about 10 minutes, it seems like. But wow. I'm biased. But uh, anyway, it's uh, uh, the uh, audio survives. I'm not sure if the video does or not, but that was in uh, the late 40s. And uh, J. Stuart Blackton went on to um, promote his early movies and do a lot of things like that. He made March of the Movies. He did talks. This is some of his, um, whenever he gave talks, this is what he would show. Um, you don't see Smith or any or Rock in any of the, in any of these, but um, this also, is a, there, there are quite a few uh, recreations in there, which yeah. Tony and I were talking about recently uh, uh, that they had to do because they didn't have the original footage. Yeah, so this is um, this is a slideshow that he would give whenever he would talk to women's clubs, and um, you know he went over the silence. There's you know pretty much outside of Vitagraph. Um, he put everybody in here. Um, first Vitagraph comedy. And, um, and he puts, of course, Edison, and then he's down here with them. <laughs> and George Eastman. Lumiere Brothers. So uh, that's just some of his things there. So any uh, closing, any closing thoughts? But we'll stick around after we say goodbye. Tomorrow, silent film watch party. Yeah. Oh, thanks for the plug on that. Yep. You see Bunny again. See Bunny and Bunny's yeah. Dilemma. And yes. if you, uh, tomorrow or in the next day or two, we will repost this along with the feudist in full with the full piano, Ben Modell's full piano score at the end. And, and your documentary. And my documentary at the beginning of this. And I'll with edit sound. it with sound. <laughs> with sound. And it'll be um, great. Anything else? I want to thank everybody. We've had um, a lot of people with us today. So um, I really appreciate everybody watching and thank um, Rena and, and David at the, the um, crew. at the crew and Dorothy yeah. and Mike, uh, Michael Bonham for posting this a thousand times on Facebook <laughs> and getting the word out. Zach Sutherland also helped to put some of this together with Craig Payne. Yeah. And um, any closing, any closing thoughts or we'll say goodbye and. We should, I guess, officially say goodbye, but then we can answer any questions or yeah. whatever, you know, people that want to stay. Okay. Well, um, okay. Well, thanks everybody for uh, watching again. You can get, Oh, yeah, I can plug my TonyZesnick.com. If you want to see the documentary, it's on YouTube. Go to <laughs> Facebook or go to JohnBunny.com, which will put, take you to the Facebook page for the John Bunny documentary. But although I made it a couple of uh, three or four years ago, I still add to that page all the time. So, um, so uh, that's it. So um, thanks for joining us. And this is our goodbye, but we're going to stick around for more questions. So thanks, everybody. Sam, Steve, thanks. I appreciate it Bye. so much. And guys.